American voters can breathe sighs of relief, at least for now, that stealing an election didn't become any easier today. The U.S. Supreme Court shut down a radical theory to upend American elections that's been more than 20 years in the making. You probably don't remember this moment from the 2000 election when Republican lawmakers in Florida held a hearing to consider appointing their own presidential electors for George W. Bush, regardless of the result of a recount ordered by the Florida Supreme Court, with testimony from California law professor John Eastman. Here, the power delegated to you by Article 2, Section 1 is a plenary power. It knows no other appeal. We cannot view those congressional statutes as altering your plenary power that you have directly by the Constitution of the United States. Eastman advocated a fringe legal theory, the independent state, legisla state legislature theory, which claims that state legislatures have broad, unchecked authority to set election rules under the Constitution's elections clause. He later pushed the theory into the, in the lead up of January 6th, trying to get states of slates of fake electors submitted in key states to hand the 2020 election to Donald Trump. But today, the Supreme Court rejected taking American democracy into the abyss. In a 6-3 to three ruling, the court rejected the independent state legislature theory in Moore v. Harper, a case about North Carolina's congressional map. Chief Justice John Roberts wrote for the majority, quote, The elections clause does not insulate state legislatures from the ordinary exercise of state judicial review. Retired federal judge Michael Ludig, the man who had to tell Mike Pence that he could not steal an election for Trump, called this case the most significant case in the history of our nation for American democracy. Today, Ludig called the decision a resounding, reverberating victory for American democracy. Judge Ludig served as co-counsel to Neil Katyal, who argued against the theory before the court. And Neil Katyal is back with me. So I want to start by thanking you for rescuing American democracy uh, by, by arguing this case, Neil. Explain in brief what the North Carolina suit was about and how significant do you agree with Michael Ludig that this is the most significant case in terms of American democracy? Yeah, you know, Joy, I have to say, it feels pretty darn good. Um, so, um, To us, too, my friend. <laughs> the reason it's so significant is this. What the Republican Party was saying in the North Carolina court and then the U.S. Supreme Court is that state legislatures can write all of the rules for elections any way they want. They don't have to care about their own constitution. They don't have to care about their own courts. So this case was about gerrymandering and, and election maps, but it's about, but the ultimate theory is about everything. It's about voting hours, absentee ballots, uh, you know, anything of, involving an election. And the Republicans were saying, courts, you have no business doing anything. It's just raw political power that will decide this. Um, that's a you know crazy theory. If you know anything about American history, our whole system is based on checks and balances. But going up into this argument, a lot of people thought that we would lose. Even after the argument, Joy, I mean, one of the hardest mm -hmm. things for me was that all the people that claimed to be on my side went and told the Supreme Court they lacked the jurisdiction to hear this case and they were afraid and wanted to get it out of the court. And you know those arguments were so wrong so misguided, and they stand as a really powerful lesson that if you carefully study and take seriously United States Supreme Court decisions, litigants can win cases that stand up for our democracy, even in this court. So, and this court is the thing that I do want to sort of talk about. Um, it was Chief Justice John Roberts, it was Sotomayor, Kagan, Kavanaugh, Coney Barrett, and Ketanji Brown-Jackson. The dissents were Clarence Thomas, Alito, and Gorsuch. The two of those don't surprise me at all um, that they would try to uh, support this theory. But the other thing that strikes me, Neil, is that it feels like the year 2000 election and Bush v. Gore are like they're like a monster that you can't kill in one of these horror movies. It just keeps coming back. John Eastman arguing that that 20 years apart, that this insane theory is what should rule our elections. Four of the members of this Supreme Court had some role in Bush v. Gore. John Roberts worked on Bush's legal team. Kavanaugh worked on Bush's legal team in Florida. Amy Coney, Amy Coney Barrett worked on Bush's legal team in Florida. And of course, Clarence Thomas was part of the 5-4 opinion. 
Bush v. Gore was said to be non-presidential, but boy, does it feel presidential. So, Joy, I think that's exactly my point here when I say, you know, people look at, like, what a justice did in their past life and think, oh, they're going to approach it a certain way and it's going to, this Bush versus Gore stuff's going to live on forever. No, the nail was put in the coffin of all of this nonsense uh, today. And it was put into put, the nail was put in by Chief Justice Roberts and joined by two Trump appointees, uh, Amy Coney Barrett and Brett Kavanaugh. And what they said is basically, uh, uh, you know, there is a there there are standard checks and balances when it comes to federal elections, and you don't just because you have the raw political power, Republican Party, you don't get to you know call the shots and say courts have no business. And so to me, it's a really strong signal being sent by six justices of our United States Supreme Court that they are going to resist efforts to monkey with, or with legislatures trying to monkey with the 2024 election. They are saying, uh-uh, we are here. We're going to review that. State courts are going to review that. And we are going to have the standard check and balance and protection of American democracy that our court system is all about. To me, it's John Roberts's finest moment on the court. I think this decision will live for a long time as a statement about the power of judicial review, about the power of courts to check political abuse. Uh, that is a resounding uh, statement. That, that, that makes me actually feel good. Let